Dear Delawareans, I am Professor Muqtada Khan. I teach Islam and Global Affairs at the University of Delaware. I am here today with a distinguished body of Muslims of Delaware to share an extraordinary moment in the history of Muslims of Delaware. What happened today at the Newcastle County Government Building is just fantastic and spectacular. The county executive, Tom Gordon, has, has issued a proclamation recognizing the two Islamic holidays, Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr, as part of the tradition of culture and religious practices of our county. And this recognition of, of our holidays has been something we have waited for. One of our members of the community said that he is waiting for this for 35 years to see that his religion and his faith and his identity is so publicly and so beautifully recognized. So for all of us who are at the moment emotionally overwhelmed, especially at a time when Islamophobia is on the rise globally and in our own country, at this moment when Muslims are portrayed as bad guys, in this moment for a politician, for a leader to come out and recognize Islam is indeed a brave thing and we are extremely grateful to Tom Gordon for doing that. So at this moment, I'm going to ask my distinguished guests to share their feelings and their emotions about what they felt and what they think is the significance of, of this spectacular event. Uh, I will first go to Dr. Salim Khan, who is a very uh, distinguished psychiatrist who's been practicing in our state for a long time and is one of the pillars of the Muslim community in Delaware. Dr. Salim Khan, isn't this absolutely fantastic? Oh, there is no question. It is more than what I was even expecting as far as the number of people who came. It was so nice to see young children. For obviously for them, this is something that they would remember for decades. Uh, as you heard again and again, how many people have been waiting for this moment to come. And it, when uh, it really happened, it surprised many of us. Uh, this uh, credit really goes to our executive, um, uh, Tom Garden, who uh, encouraged us, who led us, and who uh, made us believe that uh, the fairness and uh, equality is the way for American way, and he made it happen uh, in Delaware too. I want to also turn to Dr. Abdullah, who has been in this state for more than a decade and is an important member of the community, and he's so familiar with the African American Muslim community. What do you think is the significance of this event? Well, Dr. Khan, um, I really appreciate being a part of this panel and to be able to respond to that because. Uh, the African American community in the state uh, that are Muslim have waited a very long time to have this recognition just to be able to have more uh, community time, a closeness of the community. And uh, when I think about the atmosphere that's been out before the, polit the political atmosphere, it sort of uh, set the stage for this type of uh, important event to come out because uh, in the uh, Quran we have a verse that talks about the uh, struggles that our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had uh, gone through and it's, it goes in Arabic in the mal al usri yusra in the mal al usri yusra out of difficulty comes ease and, and out of the difficult atmosphere we have this ease has come to the Muslim community that is actually giving more credibility and uh, s sustainability and recognition by other communities. I, I, I think it's just a wonderful thing, uh, especially for our young people to have witnessed and for all of the people, especially in the African American community who have worked as Muslims to get this to be a reality. Yeah, sometimes uh, immigrant Muslims tend to measure time since their own immigration, yes. and when uh, I, I, I just realized that it's quite possible that African American Muslims in Delaware must have waited for this for probably many, many, many more decades, uh, well, than the 35 years that some of us have. The first first movement toward this was back in the 80s. Yes, that's, that's true. And so that's that's a good little that's nearly 30 years. Yes, uh, I met an African American imam who was in the audience who told me that in 1980s they had tried uh, and made an effort uh, at trying to get a proclamation of this kind. Exactly. 
Uh, I want to turn now to Dr. Navid Bafer, who is an important member of the community. He's like a social entrepreneur, has started many organizations, but he has been privy to the process. He's been privy to the process of, uh, of uh, this, uh, this proclamation uh, coming to fruition today. So I would like you to share your feelings and emotions, uh, and you are so close to it. Let's see what you have to say. I'm very curious. So for me, um, I think more important thing was how people and residents of the state have felt, the Muslim community who has been in this uh, state for, uh, for years, uh, rather centuries, uh, you know, how they have felt. So as I went along and I told some of these people, I saw tears in people's eyes. I was told that they never thought that this day would come. Uh, it, is, it is as if, you know, when I came to the U.S., I trusted America uh, with my talents, with my energies, and my knowledge. I left everything behind, and I came here. But the question was, will America trust me? So today, I felt that America trusted me, and that is the sentiment uh, across the board. I mean, that's statement of uh, Dr. Bakar actually captures uh, the, the, the depth of emotional response that Muslims are getting. For those of us uh, in Delaware who are watching this and are perhaps having trouble understanding how emotional it is, uh, let me tell you that for many decades in Germany, for example, Islam was never recognized as a religion. But yet they had mosques, so I asked them, how did you do it? They said, well, we finally gave up and registered as a labor union. Hmm. And all the mosques that you saw in Germany were community centers officially. So it was, I mean, it was horrifying to me to think that, that Muslims were not even recognized as believers. And that is something so profound. If you see the pictures and maybe even the video of uh, the actual ceremony, one of the things that will be striking to you is uh, which also defines the Muslim community of Delaware is its diversity. You will see imams who are from traditional Muslim societies. You will see imams who are from the African American community. You have members of the faith. Uh, I counted from at least eight countries were represented just today in the small uh, but uh, representative gathering. But what was also interesting is that you saw the friends of the Muslim community. So you had Rabbi Michael Beale speaking for us. You had Reverend Greg Jones speaking to us. So it so tells you that the Muslim community of Delaware Delaware is diverse and it is already well established because it has friends and connections into other communities. It has friends now in the government, it has re reached. So in that sense, the event is also a kind of a crowning glory for the growth and development of uh, Delawarean Muslims. So what I want to do in the next uh, few minutes is to, to reflect on the, the path to this moment, the path to this moment of our community. Who are the Muslims of Delaware? Where are they from? What have been the major milestones in their history? So I want to turn to Dr. Abdullah first uh, and talk to, to him about African-American Muslims and those who were Muslims uh, in Delaware for a long time. I believe it's uh, essential that people in the uh, state of Delaware should recognize the fact that uh, the Muslims that have come in large numbers from the immigrant community are not the first wave of Muslims to be in the state of Delaware. In fact, Muslims have been in the state of Delaware since the recorded, first recorded history in the 18th century when we were talking about the Moorish Americans and they came over as a result of America's uh, contractual relationship with Morocco and a trade agreement, and uh, it was known as the Barbary States, uh, and uh, many of the Moorish uh, uh, sailors came over to the Delaware shores. So this has been a long history, but it has been an uh, underground history. One that Muslims, as you mentioned, the uh, Muslims in Germany, um, uh, Islam was not a faith that could be practiced outwardly, because during the 19th century, we know that it was like the height of slavery, and uh, if you were a slave brought over and you spoke Arabic, you were punished. If you uh, claimed to the faith of al-Islam, you were punished or maybe even worse. So it was not something they wanted to uh, just stamp out any kind of uh, acceptance or, or practice of Islam. So for many, many decades, there was no practice of Islam, no recognition of Islam until 
uh, there was a movement of black nationalism that really didn't uh, pretty much generate itself until the 19, uh, 1910. 1913 was the first time any organized effort of getting just African Americans together in any kind of cohesive manner it was Delaware. really sad. Here in Delaware. Well, actually, started outside Delaware, but you know, this was a national movement, okay. and there were chapters that, that came. And I'm, I'm talking back to the uh, Morris Science Temple of America. And um, at the same time, you had the Negro Improvement uh, 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 Association that was started by Marcus Garvey. Um, so, in the Noble Drew Ali was the one who started the uh, uh, Morris Science Temple of America. But these were like the base that was used to empower and give the strength and integrity to an African American community that felt totally disenfranchised, totally disavowed almost from American society. To give them that strength to come together as a society. So when one member from the uh, Morris Science Temple uh, branched out on his own, uh, his name was uh, 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 Mohammed, uh, at, at the time the, uh, he, he came, he started what was then known as just the Nation of Islam. Yeah. And uh, he taught uh, Elijah Mohammed, who went on to become the leader of this Nation of Islam. And during just one <coughs> random uh, interview, uh, the interviewer uh, asked about the Nation of Islam, and he said he was, they were Muslim, and he said, so, so you're the the black Muslims. And for some reason that stuck. It, we became known as the black Muslim, but that was not until the 1950s. So the first organized movement of any kind of Muslim outside of the more science temple that really weren't like Muslims. That it, it, I could go into that, but there's a lot of history behind it. Have to go but, into but, but is it true that when Muslims in Delaware wanted to change their name to Muslim names, they actually had to go to court? Well, uh, that's the process. Whenever you want to change your name legally, you have to go to court. But they had lots of challenges to do that. Yes, well, the, the, the challenges, I started uh, in the faith of al-Islam and the nation of Islam in uh, Boston and, and moved to Maryland, and I had to go to the court uh, in Maryland as well. But what we tried to do in a lot of the communities was get a group together name change. So okay. it was like a whole, like hundreds of people mm -hmm. were changing their other ones. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it, it became, was like a ceremony. Yeah, it was a ceremony, yes. Yeah. So it yeah. was much easier. But uh, that's what we had to when, go through. When academics and historians write the story of uh, history of Islam in America, they, they like to use this wave theory. They say there are practically three waves of massive immigration to, of Muslims to America. The first wave was uh, as part of slavery. Some people estimate that more than 20% of all the slaves that were brought to America may have been Muslims. We have historical evidence, we have written text testimonies, we have books, diaries, we have markings on trees, etc., in Arabic uh, that uh, date the presence of Islam mm -hmm. to long before the United States. The second wave of uh, migration of Muslims was more like a trickle effect where a lot of uh, Christian Arabs who came to America in the 1900s. But every Christian family that came to America had a Muslim in it, the brother-in-law, son-in-law, or daughter-in-law, something like that. So a lot of Muslims came with the Christian migration. And of course, then the third wave, which is the biggest, is after uh, the civil rights movement and immigration reform in 1965. So mm -hmm. after 1965, we saw this huge, huge wave of Muslims coming to America to such an extent that right now you could argue that American Muslims are sort of three communities. One third of it is African American Muslims, one third of it are South Asians, and one third of it are Arab Muslims. So Dr. Salim Khan has probably been here since the 1960s, and uh, I, I would love to hear the, about the experience of uh, what are now referred to as uh, immigrant Muslims or uh, Muslims from the traditional Muslim country who came after 1960s? Yeah, my family is certainly from that uh, third wave that you described. Um, actually, uh, in the first few years, uh, the number of people coming uh, from Southeast Asia and some parts of Middle East, uh, primarily Egypt, uh, the number was not that high. And it is more true for Delaware. 
uh, if I can remember all the way back, uh, going 35 years, uh, for almost um, 15 years or so, uh, we used to say in this particular immigrant uh, Muslim uh, community, there were about 30 active families. And to get anything done was very, very difficult. In those days, to find special restaurants or shops where you could buy a kosher uh, or Islamic uh, way of uh, slaughtered meat. Uh, people, uh, including us, uh, we were traveling to Trenton, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York. Uh, um, and then things started changing. Uh, and uh, our, uh, for the immigrants, the first mosque, uh, we started uh, thinking about that in mid-80s. And uh, the first step, uh, as it was taken by our visionary president of that time, um, Brother Yahya Hashim, who just moved out of this area, that he uh, bought a piece of land. And uh, then for years and years, uh, we did a lot of uh, fundraisers. And uh, the money was very limited. and. Um, there were only so many people, and they couldn't imagine that uh, a day will come when they would have uh, their own mosque. Mm -hmm. And if I you know, remember, one day my wife said, you can't have a building, a mosque, unless you show something. Mm -hmm. People are not going to give you funds. I think that was a word of wisdom, not only myself. I was the president then. I heard it, and other people, and I started saying that in my appeals, and sure enough, uh, based on that, we did the initial foundation. And then things started changing. Now people knew we are talking about a reality. It is not just asking people to give money. And the effect of the money coming in doubled, tripled, and quadrupled in a very short period of time. So a dream became a possibility. Yes, and uh, uh, at that time, uh, I remember we had $80,000, and the foundation was there, and uh, architects said that you need $325,000, mm. and we thought it's impossible. But with the grace of Allah, within less than one year, all that money was raised people's enthusiasm was just worth seeing. And the excitement was everywhere. And myself as a president started saying, this project will be completed when every household, even if they're not very involved, they are talking about this project. And that happened on every dinner, any social get together. And that time we, we used to pray in the University of Delaware. We used to have our Eid prayers there. And we were asking, begging, uh, like Goldie Beacom College, even Ch uh, Ch uh, Cheney State in Pennsylvania, where we can take our children just for Sunday school. And then, alhamdulillah, start, things uh, started changing. I still remember that. People were, did not care that we did not have 100% approval from the county, mm -hmm. this Newcastle County. <laughs> and there were some wires hanging. And they said, no, we want to pray Friday prayer. <laughs> and then the issue was um, that uh, the very first Friday prayer, we were short of parking. Oh my God, the parking and is still And now I can, <laughs> having seen the last 15, 20 years, I can comfortably say that because of those developments, the, the, this mosque and other mosques, which maybe our um, friend uh, Naveed can say more about it, people from all around the country started coming to this state. And the, the, the way the number of Muslims increased in Delaware in the last 10, 15 years is amazing. From those 30 active families, now we have 1,500 to 2,000. And as you all know that sometimes when we have our Eid uh, in Chase Center, they count six to 7,000 individuals. 
Yeah. <laughs> one of the things, you know, when you study history is that you look for continuity, and, and, and one of the continuities in Muslim history in America is that we still struggle in many places uh, for parking. <laughs> yes. Right? Especially, I mean, some mosques do have uh, adequate parking, uh, but we prefer. I want to now turn to Dr. Navid Bakher, who, who, who probably has his finger on the pulse of the community to, to, to share with us, I mean, what is the state of Muslims of Delaware? I mean, how many mosques, what kind of institutions, what are the trends in the community, where do you see the community going from here? So for a very long time, uh, Masjid al Qawthar was the only masjid uh, started in, uh, in the 50s. Uh, the African American, the African -American uh, community primarily, uh, but of course there are other uh, people who, you know, who are not African Americans who live in the vicinity. They also use that mosque, uh, uh, and then in the 70s, 80s, uh, you know, one immigrant mosque started in Newark. Uh, however, more recently, the dynamics have changed. And if I were to attribute one single factor, and of course there is not one single factor, there are many other factors, but if I were to take a pulse and pick one, uh, I think it is because of the Islamic schools uh, uh, establishing in Delaware. Even though there has been a history of Islamic schools, you know, off and on uh, efforts going on by some community members, motivated community members, uh, they were not consistent. Every few years, um, you know, a school will start, Islamic school will start, and then it'll shut down. In 2010, the dynamics changed. Um, a school with the name Tarbiya School started, <clears throat> and shortly after that, there was another Islamic school started, and that started attracting a lot of uh, people to the to the community. I see a number of people who tell me that they have moved simply because of Islamic schools. I hear from people who tell me that they were about to move out and they have decided not to move uh, because of the Islamic school. Within, uh, you know, that's one factor. Another important factor is the establishment of new mosques. Right now, uh, uh, you know, according to the latest count uh, that Delaware Council on Global and Muslim Affairs has done, we have about 12 mosques in the state of Delaware, eight of those in Newcastle County alone. And uh, right here, uh, you know, within four miles radius of the studio, we have four mosques uh, that have been, many of them, three of them have been established within the last four or five years. So, and if you go to any of these uh, mosques on a Friday, you'll see that Every single mosque is full to its capacity. Um, most masajids have problems with parking. You know, there's not enough parking available, and there are plans to to expand uh, the physical infrastructure uh, to to support uh, that growth. So, um, you know, these are the number of uh, mos mosques, two schools. There are there is also a growth in um, you know organizations that are run, started and run by Muslims uh, on various specific aspects of the community. Uh, we have, uh, for example, Zakat Foundation. We have uh, a number of other organizations that, that specialize in a specific area for the Muslim community and provide different types of services. Uh, so that's where we stand. Well. What percentage do you think of the Muslim community's children go to Islamic school? Uh, obviously, there are no um, official records uh, for this data, so most of this is based upon, um, you know, guesstimates. Yes. Uh, in the two Islamic schools that I'm talking about, one of the Islamic schools has about 200 students. The other Islamic school has about 140 students. and uh, there is also a history behind it. Six years ago when these <clears throat> schools were starting, the general atmosphere and feeling was that there are no more than 60, maybe 70 students who would go to an Islamic school. And guess what? In 2010, Therbiya School started. In 2011, uh, Islamic Academy of Delaware started. And both schools started at its capacity with 
each having more than 60 kids uh, in the very first year. And since then, the numbers have grown steadily. Uh, and estimates are that, that this does not even represent maybe 15, 20 percent of the total Muslim students' population. There are, there are a lot more students who still go to uh, uh, public school, charter school, for a number of reasons. Um, some may not be able to afford an Islamic school because Islamic schools are obviously, uh, however low, they do charge uh, a fee. Uh, they may have scholarship programs, but obviously, you know, there's no state funding, there's no um, financial system, other financial system except for the tuition, uh, and some cannot afford it. Some may have other reasons not to come to uh, Islamic schools. So. That's where we stand. So, so we have about <coughs> eight to 12 mosques in the state, depending on the county and, mm -hmm. and the level of development. We have uh, several places where we can buy halal food, we can eat halal food, we have two Islamic schools. Uh, what, what, where do Muslims go next? I mean, where do they put in their resources, uh, their energy? What is, is, if there is a vision that is driving uh, institutional and community development? Uh, across the country, I've traveled and spoken in many Muslim communities in the past. I've even written a book about American Muslims, and I've noticed that uh, in terms of institution building, besides the halal meat store, the restaurants, the, the mosques, and Islamic schools, we have not developed any other. I mean, yes, there is a, a Muslim clinic in Los Angeles. Uh, there is a, an emerging Muslim college also in California with Zaytuna. There are a lot of virtual institutions and service institutions which essentially redistribute wealth, uh, service zakat, etc. But what do you think should be the next step for Muslims uh, in Delaware in particular, given the nature of Delaware society, Delaware politics, given the strengths and weaknesses of the community in Delaware, where do you think oh, we should go next? Uh, I will focus more on that wave that you said, uh, which is the mo immigrant Muslims. And uh, within that, there are s smaller waves. And the initial wave was only those who had professional degrees. They were eager to learn more and advance themselves. And most of them were able to do that. So their ethics was very clear, educationally oriented, hardworking, law abiding. And uh, those people now, most of them are very well placed. And they have been able to uh, convey their values to their children and have made sure that their children not only get proper education, but also um, they work hard to get into the best of the best institutions. Uh, along the way, there have been efforts to make uh, Islamic centers, mosques, and there has been a feeling that brick and mortar is fine, but now is the time that we need to think more about it because uh, the initial struggle for survival, uh, we are way beyond that. So it is the time to think about giving back volunteer work and um, donations to, uh, for different kinds of causes, Muslims, non-Muslims, and um, helping our neighbors in any which way we can. And um, for people like yourself and others, also thinking about uh, Islamic thought and uh, how we can convey the, the beauty and the message of our religion. And lately, with all the changes uh, that we are witnessing around us, uh, it is being felt in a very significant way that we cannot just stay to ourselves in our own small communities. This is the time we need to become uh, more involved be more in the midstream America and encourage our friends and our children and grandchildren to do the same thing and um, participate in different activities and committees and county and state level and be part of uh, the active po politics 
and uh, hope that uh, gradually our people will start running for uh, different positions. I mean, if I look at uh, the total uh, country, in, even including uh, um, Canada to make it North America, all those things that I mentioned, they are definitely happening. The realization is there and is becoming more and more strong that we are part of the main America, uh, American dream and American fiber and mainstream, and we need to put our efforts in the right direction for that. So, so basically what Dr. Khan is suggesting is that the American Muslim community now look outward rather yes. than inward and try to reach out to, to either the political arena or towards uh, interfaith relations, reach out to other communities. Uh, I, I wanted to make a comment uh, before I uh, turn to our other guests. One of the things that uh, should drive a community's vision is how they define a good Muslim. What, what do you really mean by a good Muslim? Is a good Muslim a person who, who's carrying symbols of Islam? So you wear a turban or you have a, a beard or a particular kind of a dress that you do or you eat a particular kind of a... So there are these external symbols which are like, it's like wearing a watch and then you can take it out and keep. Or is a good Muslim is one person who's who is substantively good in terms of, say, a person who cares for humanity, a person who, who does, serves others, a person who will stand up for justice, who will speak for truth. So I think what probably we need to do is, now that we have taken care of what Maslow would call as basic needs or mm -hmm. hygiene factors, that we have taken care of basic needs. We have a place to pray on Friday. Those who want to send their children to Islamic schools, they can change. Those who want to eat halal meat, they can buy halal meat. Uh, if you want to buy Islamic books, so there are lots and lots of stores. In Philadelphia, they, it took me a whole day to look at all the bookstores there. But what we need to perhaps do is have a conversation about uh, given all the special opportunities that are available to American Muslims, which may not be available to other Muslims uh, outside America, are there any special things uh, that perhaps uh, God expects uh, American Muslims to do besides just uh, living their lives uh, prosperous and uh, with s Islamic uh, markers uh, on their body and their car and in their homes? So what do you think? Well, uh, I'm going to actually um, let uh, uh, Dr. Navi Bakker um, answer this first because his direction, what his community, or I shouldn't say his community, but the segment of the community that he has been able to really impact has been just right on mark. I, I'll just say that. And, and so I would like to divert. <clears throat> for, for me, vision of the future for us is that the older generation <clears throat> is like a it's like a petri dish it's like an incubator where our main responsibility is to give america something that it deserves and that is that new generation that calls this country home that they don't have any other any other any other country to look towards they know that this is their home this is where they need to uh, make a difference. This is where they need to make all their contributions. And that's what I think the Muslim community uh, more recently has been trying to do. And my hope is that as our generation, new generation, uh, starts to, to uh, make an impact, uh, that impact will be felt even more. Uh, it is also my hope uh, and my vision that, uh, that we all, we all are able to support this. Uh, by doing this, not only we are making, we are giving back to America, actually America is also giving back to Islam. You know, a lot of things that we cannot think about doing in other quote unquote Islamic countries, we are able to do those things here without fear of persecution or, you know, other types of repercussions. So. So that is a gift that America is giving to Islam, that it is redefining, it is allowing Islam to redefine itself, our youth to prosper and grow in an environment where they, where they are not ashamed of their heritage. They are proud of their heritage, but they are also proud of being Americans, and they, they have stake in this country. 
Uh, thank you, Navid, for those thoughtful ideas. And I think that's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, it's not just what we are taking from America, but what can we do for America? Uh, before we wrap up, uh, Dr. Abdullah, do you have anything else to add to this? Perhaps uh, you have been inspired by these two visionaries on my right and my left? Well, uh, I, I don't know if I can say inspired is the proper term, but I, I am moved to know that um, both have indicated how America have uh, given to them and helped the Muslim community, and helped the growth of uh, the Muslim community here in Delaware. And what I want to add to the whole conversation um, is to point out the fact that as m the Muslim community continue to grow and the benefits that we have received uh, as a community and especially the, the African American community that uh, sort of set the, the foundation for Islam being able to have such a growth, a great growth and development in the state is to point out that now we need to act as the temper for the other Delawareans um, to whatever frustration, whatever uh, imposition, whatever uh, that they feel is not capable of being achieved. Uh, uh, Muslims with greater, uh, I wouldn't say greater knowledge, but greater benefits that have come to them can act as that, that agent, that, that, that sort of, uh, 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 escort to, to uh, shepherd Delaware into a better future, economically, politically, um, socially, and, and I think we have seen the benefit because we, we've come from here to go there, and, and, and now we can actually shepherd others. So I, I think we need to look at uh, what we've been blessed with and sort of use the knowledge and the benefits that we have received to sort of share and to help Delaware to grow more intellectually, socially, uh, and, and, and um, economically sound in a way that at the Muslim community knows how it should be done in terms of what our faith has taught us because of the, all that we do in, in our life is all centered around our religion, and we don't separate the politics or the economics or the uh, education from it. It's, it's one complete package, and I think we in a very good position to show this to other Delawareans and, and not let them feel as though they need to struggle with what this economy or what the political atmosphere is really bringing to them. It's quite remarkable, listening to all three of these gentlemen, is that in spite of the uh, Islamophobic environment in which we have been living for the past few years, and also hearing bad news coming from certain parts of the Muslim world, the depth and degree and extent of optimism mm. that you both, all three of you reflect, is amazing. Your confidence in the American Muslim community and your confidence in America is truly remarkable. And I think that is the most important part of the story, is that Muslims feel confident that they will be doing well in this country. And part of that confidence comes essentially from events and moments like today's. What we witness today, the proclamation that recognizes the two Eids of Muslims in Newcastle County, essentially says that America, in spite of what is happening on the global front, in spite of what is happening in our political arena, mm. is open, tolerant, and willing to embrace Muslims and consider them as part of America, part of Newcastle County, part of Delaware. I too would like to indulge in a vision. I believe that one of the greatest gifts that America has given to Muslims is an intellectual opportunity and help them carve out a uniquely American Islamic intellectual tradition, a tradition that is particularly shaped by American values of pluralism, religious tolerance, uh, appreciation for democracy, appreciation for multiculturalism, and I think it is the responsibility of American Muslims to use this opportunity to develop and articulate an interpretation of Islam which is deeply beautiful and manifest that in their communities. An Islam which we talk about, but an Islam that we don't find in many parts of the world. An Islam which is open to others. An Islam for which pushes Muslims and everybody else in the community to become uh, those who take care of others, who, who do ihsan all the time in their life. Ihsan means to do beautiful things. Uh, I want to end 
this note with one very short phrase from the Quran where God says that he loves people who do beautiful things. Uh, and I think that Muslims have an opportunity to become a community that does beautiful things. One of the things that eventually comes up every time we talk about Islam in America and about Muslims and their experiences that this tremendously deeply felt appreciation for the freedoms that we enjoy in America, especially religious freedoms and intellectual freedoms. Uh, I think, uh, and this is clearly biased from my profession and what I do, I think America's greatest gift to Islam is an American tradition of Islamic thought. Mm -hmm. and a, a uniquely American uh, tradition of Islamic thought which is informed by uh, appreciation for values of pluralism, for democracy, for tolerance, uh, for multiculturalism, and also particularly focused from a rigorous scholarly perspective on Islamic tradition. So when we go to Islamic traditions, we don't go with a, per, per, a sectarian bias or, 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 or perspective that people are willing to go to Islamic traditions from an open mind. So I think that's one of the best things that has happened to Muslims. And so we have become a kind of what you would call as, uh, I mean, it sounds very arrogant and lots of people in the Muslim world may not like it, but I think we have an intellectual duty also to perform mm. to the Muslim world where we articulate the most beautiful form of Islam and hopefully also manifest in our society. So on this wonderful day, I want to thank, uh, thank God for, for what has happened to us today, recognition of, two, of our festivals, and I hope that you also learn a little bit about Islam and Muslims who live in Delaware. Thank you very much. Thomas, before I introduce the next speaker, who is the most important speaker today, I want to remind you about one of our former presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, who was also a police officer before he became president. But what was interesting was that the Muslims of New York did not ever refer to Teddy Roosevelt as President <coughs> Roosevelt or Police Chief Roosevelt. They always referred to him as Khalif Harun Rashid. And the reason for that was because Teddy Roosevelt used to go out in the night into the neighborhoods of the immigrants of New York and he used to go and check as to how the immigrants in those communities were doing. He wanted to know whether the newcomers to the city of New York were safe in his city when he was chief of police. So every time I meet with Tom, I remember of this analogy of Harun Rashid. And Tom has over the years been very friendly to the American Muslim community in Delaware. He has visited our masajid. He probably knows every mosque in the county. He has spoken at many of our events. He has even spoken in my class very recently about outreach to Muslim communities. And what he's doing now for the Muslim community is perhaps really uh, Something that is an example for the rest of the country. I think all the politicians in America who are talking about integrating and assimilating Muslims and making Muslims feel at home, they have to learn from Tom Gordon. Nothing makes us feel at home uh, as much as embracing not just us, but also our faith. So today, Tom Gordon is going to recognize our ease, and in doing that, I hope he makes all the Muslims who live in Delaware feel more Delawarean today. Right. Tom. Before I start, let me recognize our <coughs> Chief Administrative Officer. Tim Mulaney is on the back steps here. He's very much wanted to be here today. <laughs> Before I read this proclamation, which I am extremely honored to be able to do today, that I want to say that I'm glad that all the different religious communities came today to support this, and we have had my rabbi here with me today. But uh, I think Reverend Jones said it all. Um, it's a shame what's going on in this country with some of the rhetoric. And we're here to say that uh, and we've had a bad relationship for over three years with our Muslim community. I've made so many friends and I'm just very proud. It's, it's sad that uh, we even have to hear some of the rhetoric that's going on with the presidential race. Somebody said uh, that we're going to patrol Muslim communities and here's the deal. All of our communities are Muslim communities. You might find them as your doctor, your neighbor, your civic association, but they're your friend. And we've got to fight against just, it only lasts till November and it ends. 
but uh, somebody found a, uh, you know that it was a good thing to pick on one religion or another. Islam is the second largest religion in the country, in the world, and it's soon going to be number one. They're peaceful, they're loving, and I got to know so many of them. Now my hardest problem is going to be speaking in Arabic. So uh, from my, from my proclamation, which I want to read, because I am just deeply honored to be able to do this today, because it is so unfair that every religion is recognized, but a Muslim religion. But a child might not be able to take the day off in a very important, ceremonious, very sacred day. And to be able to do this is so small that uh, what I say to all your children is Newcastle County, the police department, the paramedics, it's all your friends, it's your government. And you're welcome anytime. Come by my office and have a cup of coffee. And again, I want to salute all the religious leaders that made this so valuable to show that everybody is standing up and saying, we have our holidays, why shouldn't you have your holidays? So let me start with a proclamation that I'm probably most proud of doing in my 12 years as executive. From the office of the county executive of Newcastle County, be it hereby known to all, the Honorable Thomas B. Gordon, Newcastle County Executive, issues this proclamation to recognize Muslim holidays. Ida Felter and Ida Ada. We're going to we're work on that. Whereas Islam is one of the world's major religions, part of our shared <coughs> human heritage. And whereas the history of the people of the Muslim faith includes some of the greatest and most advances in innovation, society, and history of human existence. Whereas from the early days of the pioneers to our present day leaders, Muslims have played a significant role in the history of Newcastle County's economic, cultural, spiritual, and political. And whereas there are several thousand Muslims residing in Newcastle County, Delaware, contributing every day to the economy, the social fabric, the multicultural and pluralistic traditions of this state, whereas the Muslims reside in Newcastle County and in the state of Delaware with their hard work and contributions to medicine, to science, to information society, technology, to education, and so many other fields that we know have benefited from enriched and they have enriched and open tolerance and economically vibrant economy of our county. Whereas the Muslims annually celebrate two religious holidays, Eid al fitr and the Holy Month fasting of Ramadan, where I have got to attend outside of Ramadan, and I couldn't believe 7,000 people inside that got my attention. That uh, what a wonderful, beautiful, beautiful off script for a second. What a wonderful, peaceful religion. And Eid al during the pilgrimage pilgrim, 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 pilgrim of Haja. And whereas, in accordance with the sentiments of the United States President, Barack Obama, Ramadan is a time to respect spiritually, build communally, and aid in those in need. While Eid al marks the end of the Ramadan, it marks a new beginning for each individual, a reason to celebrate and to express the gratitude of this holiday. And whereas, during the two eras, all people are encouraged to reflect on the past successes and challenges of the Muslims and look forward to the future to continue to improve our society so that we live up to the ideas of freedom, equality, and justice. Whereas Newcastle County recognizes the celebration of both Muslim holidays henceforth as part of and parcel to the county's religious and to our cultural heritage. And whereas, I extend the best regards to the Muslims in the of County, Delaware, and throughout the world who celebrate it out there and it out there. And whereas, as these holidays are celebrated, this community must remember the critical importance of the respect that this is to be accorded to all faiths and beliefs 
as reflected in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution that prohibits the making of any law respecting an establishment of religion, impeding the free and exercise of religion. Whereas the Kessler County Executive recommends that schools and employers in New Kessler County extend religious accommodation in accordance with existing laws to many Muslim students in our schools and Muslim workers throughout our county. I would include the state of Delaware. Therefore, now I come to the board of Newcastle County Executive of Newcastle County. By virtue of the authority vested in me, I do hereby recognize Ed Alfeda and Ed Alhada in Newcastle County, Delaware, and be it firmly resolved that I encourage all Newcastle County residents to join me in celebrating the collective ingenuity, creativity, culture, and traditions of the Muslims and commit ourselves to raise the awareness and appreciation of the two others by participating in events honoring the contributions of Muslims. I call upon officials, educators, librarians, and all the people of Newcastle County to observe the two edas with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. And I'm signing this today on the 19th day of April, 2016, by order of the County Executive Thomas B. Gordon, and I'm very proud to do it.